Welcome everybody to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. You joined us on one of the best days of the week, not for why what you might think, because it is Friday, but on Fridays we have our fabulous Ask and Answered episodes. Um, we partner with Fundraising Academy at National University. They're very generous and they lend us one of their talents. These folks come from all over the country, sometimes all over the world, and then they answer the questions that come into us. And so we ha get to have a little dialogue. We don't always agree on what the right answer is, um, which I think makes it even more fun and more interesting. And today we have back with us Mui Kwaja, um, one of the trainers at um, Fundraising Academy, but also I got to say, I think this is kind of more interesting. Really, Muhi, the, as a co-founder of the American Muslim Community Foundation, you bring a different lens of things um, because you work in the nonprofit space on more of a national level. And so this is a really fun opportunity for us to get your voice. Um, and we'll learn more about some of the things that you're working on later. But at this point, we need to make sure we thank all of our partners that join us day in and day out. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. If you want to get to any more, any of our 900 plus episodes, you can find us on our app, streaming or podcast formats. We are wherever you want to join us. Okay, Muhi, are you ready for question number one? Let's do it. Okay, this is an interesting question because it's a loaded question, um, and I don't have the answer so much, but I think it's fascinating. It comes to us from Andrew um, from Orange County, California, and he writes, what do you suggest we do when it comes to finding a new treasurer for our board? This is an important role, and we don't just want to hand it over to anyone. So this question is like, you would never ask this question like, how do we get like a new secretary or a new board member? Like the answer is not going to be the same. This is something it's, it's really perilous if you don't get it right. I think, what do you think? Yeah. You know, um, AMCF has recently had a changeover in our board. So we had to look for a new treasurer. Uh, mm -hmm. and one of the things that we did was see who's filed our nine nineties for us in the past if there was any interest uh, from an accountant uh, that has helped us, has experience with nonprofit organizations, okay. have they helped the organization go through an audit? Um, have they submitted 990s themselves? Uh, have they helped stay in compliance with state regulations, federal regulations? Um, so these are some of the skill sets that we personally looked for in finding a new treasurer. Um, I would say try to find somebody who is a CPA. Yeah. Um, and that would be a great place to start. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. You know, it's really hard because I think technically you will find um, most boards or most CPAs and people in accounting and finance will recognize that when they're doing board service, they cannot act as um, that voice of authority. They, they are a board fiduciary, right? Member, uh, board member with a, a fiduciary aspect, but they are not going to be the ones that do the audits, that do all the, the actual work. That has to have that arm's length transaction piece, right? But they have to help advise the board if this is being done right or it's being done wrong or they need to find, you know, um, a better system or maybe a better provider. So it's a leadership um, and knowledge based role that is really hard. And um, I know Muhi in, in, you know, most every state of the union, there is, um, you know, a CPA society for that state. And most sure. of them have nonprofit um, committees or sections because it's such a big, you know, uh, big chunk of the sector, it might be worth contacting your local society of CPAs. And in, in the case of California, there might be like a Northern California and a Southern California. I don't know, because it's such a big, you know, state. Um, and find out if there's a way to connect to those nonprofit, you know, oriented CPAs and see if anybody's interested in, in volunteering because 
it's a critical, critical role. And did, were you able, have you found with the American uh, Muslim Community Foundation a, a treasurer or are you? Yeah. So oddly enough, our treasurer is based in Orange County. So Andrew, oh. sorry, we took one <laughs> candidate away from you. Um, but really? yeah, we were able to find a great CPA who joined our board recently. So we're excited. Oh. Seriously, this has, this is not related. I mean, this just, you know, these questions just come in. So your, your offices are based in Michigan, but, but you have a board that is, that comes from across the country. So nationally, uh, we were founded in the Bay, San Francisco Bay area wow. in California. But okay. as a virtual organization, we don't have any primary office, but we use uh, the San Francisco Bay Area as our headquarters. Uh, so we're registered with the state of California. Uh, and nationally, our staff is in Pittsburgh and Virginia and Detroit. And our board members are uh, in the Bay Area and SoCal and New York. Um, and we operate nationally, so we try to have board members from different regions so that we can better connect in other communities and have people learn more about AMCF's work. Okay, cool. That makes sense. You know, as much as I identify you as the co-founder, I just assumed it was like a Michigan-based um, organization. I had no idea. That's cool. Okay, well, Andrew, like uh, Muhi said, sorry if... Um, if Mui's group stole your potential board, your treasurer board member, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing to look at. And you're right. You've got to be looking at this with a lot of strategy. Let's go on to our next question. And that comes to us from Chandra in Las Vegas. She writes, we will be having our first gala next month. Could you recommend some best practices for post events? We will use volunteers to assist with this or these tasks. Yeah, so I love this question. Um, the stewardship aspect we've talked about in the cost selling cycle is one of the most critical steps, uh, just as important as receiving the gift. Mm -hmm. So when you are looking at your registrant list, see who actually attended, and then from that, see who actually made a gift. And I would pull all of those reports that you can that help you with that information mm -hmm. and then ask the volunteers to write thank you cards, um, mm -hmm. develop a script based on whether somebody gave, whether somebody attended, whether somebody registered and didn't attend and mm -hmm. segment that script accordingly and drop those postcards in the mail or little thank you envelopes or a we missed you envelope whatever you can to personalize it and get those out within a week or two of the event. And it's a nice touch point uh, for those who registered and attended and made a gift. Um, so I would say that is one best practice you should look into. The other is of course, you know, sending your thank you for attending email that goes out to everyone uh, and then you also want to look into more personalized one-on-one -on -one outreach, asking a survey for feedback, how the event went, what went well, what could have been better. Um, and there's okay. a lot to learn in those areas. Okay. That's especially for your first event. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good idea. Um, that might be a little hard to hear or hard to swallow for some organizations to get that feedback, but I think it's, I think it's smart little scary you know we, we had a guest on earlier in the week kevin spikerman and he made the really interesting comment which i i felt like it was kind of one of those duh moments that i should have known this but he made the comment that at a gala or an auction event make sure that you are recording um you know writing down the name and the bid paddle uh uh, uh paddle number for folks that were in the game on higher level numbers but maybe didn't win the bid because if they got up to let's say you know they lost out on a five thousand dollar bid for something and they they went all the way up to 4500 that means they have some sort of capacity they might not have Definitely. won the bid, but you know get them out to coffee get them in to find out how you can 
you know, build, start building a new relationship. And I was like, yeah, because usually there's only one winner, right? And so sure. everybody else that had marched up to that higher amount. And I would even contact uh, the organization or business that donated the auction item and say, hey, we have a second person at 4,500. Would you be able to donate a second one and see what happens there? Right, right. Yeah, I think with some of these bigger items, especially when you have um, travel um, to find out if there's a way to get, you know, multiples of that. I mean, if it's like a, an autographed, you know, football or something, we only have one. Okay, that's one thing. Sure. But, but if you have some opportunities for doubling up on that experiential opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Chandra, I hope this helps. Good luck. Um, remember the hard work happens the day after your event, not going into your event. You might think it does, but really, to Mui's point, it's the stewardship um, issue that's really, really important. Okay, this is another interesting question, and given that you uh, shared with us that you are working with board members from across the country, I think you're a great person, Mui, to address this. It comes to us from Jackie um, in New Orleans, and she writes, how important are, is board of directors onboarding we have a few new members but they are at different levels should we do this all at once or do it with each new board member as they come on we have a lot of differing opinions in our nonprofit on this topic so onboarding for those of you who might not be familiar with it it's just like you would onboard a new employee you have um, expectations set you have if you have documents uh, that need to be secured or signed like ndas or hipaa laws anything that might be of a legal policy that needs to be addressed signed off on or navigated that's when you would do this so you you get that done really before they start acting as a fiduciary or voting or you know participating but this is a hard this is a heavy lift for a lot of folks because you might have one person right and then you got to do all this do you wait what do you think and how have you done this Muhi? yeah i love this question um amcf is down to three board members right now so we're actually recruiting for uh board positions and when we have onboarded people, sometimes they've been two at a time, five at a time, things like that. So we almost have like term classes of board members and try to do the onboarding together. Sometimes schedules don't align, so we do them one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, but at a bare minimum, like you said, we have an NDA, we have a board mm -hmm. agreement that they also sign what the expectations are. Term limit is three years, making a meaningful financial contribution to the org annually, connecting us with their network. These are all things that they sign on and agree to. Um, so beyond that, it's also taking the time to give them the history of our organization, the different programs and services that we offer. Uh, and sometimes that could be an hour call or they have a lot of questions. So we want to make sure that we are providing them with enough time that they feel comfortable learning about the organization. And typically these questions are even asked before they join the board. But yeah. then once they join, then there's a formal orientation. Um, so Jackie, I'd be interested in, you know, maybe even are the differing opinions in the nonprofit coming from the board members themselves. <laughs> yeah. uh, and we've, we've had board members that were critical of our orientation process. They were like, you know, let's have a mentor mentee on the board that kind of walks us through and it's their responsibility to be like answering all the questions that they have. And you can go about it differently a few different ways. Um, but I would say that the orientation is a critical point in order to engage and that's the board members stewardship plan right they need to be stewarded in being board members as well so when you say we is this like walk us through in your experience has this been like staff ceo leadership or board chair or everybody or like because you know information is only as good as it is accurate right yeah so yeah you got to make sure that the message being delivered is accurate right so how do you and consistent 
and consistent consistency yeah yeah so typically that has been led by the co-founders um and whether it was myself or we've had a co-founder that was a board member um and board president before so we have um split the duty but sometimes it is the board chair that is on the board interviews and also the um orientation process and our board president currently was the past treasurer of the board. Oh. Um, so when it was coming time to recruit the current board treasurer, they were actively involved in the process. Um, so it's been board members. It's been some of the co-founders. And we do this orientation for our staff members as well. We just hired a director of finance. Um, so we had to do an orientation with them as well. So uh, we treat it the same, but we want that presentation to be accurate, consistent, and everything like that. So that's an interesting thing, because what I hear you saying is not maybe, it's not necessarily what I would have thought, but I think it's smart. And that is to take that orientation that you might be doing for staff. And especially as you navigate from C-suite to board, there should be a lot of alignment. And so you, mm -hmm. you know, you have that, not a one and done, but I would imagine you got to be like, you know, 90% the same information, right? Whether you're right. staff or your board. Exactly. Yeah. And then the roles and responsibilities is what's yeah. different, but yeah. yeah. Interesting. Well, yeah, Jackie, you know, I'm a man, I'm a big believer in this. And I also think that, um, I don't think you need to just do this for the new board members. I think there's no harm, no foul in doing this with existing board members you know it freshens things up maybe things change maybe it reminds them mm -hmm. um, maybe it re cements a relationship you know or a value to that stewardship so don't just look at it as we do this once and then we never have to address it again because that's just not realistic these board members oftentimes serve other organizations or they have mm -hmm. lives they have you know, they're, they're being tossed and turned in their communities and at home and in their businesses and in their work life. So to readdress some of these things, I think is a healthy thing personally. Yeah. And to that point, like AMCF hosts a annual meeting with the board where they go over all of these responsibilities and the bylaws and articles of incorporation and what their duties are. Uh, and then there's a separate meeting that is the strategic plan where we touch briefly on the programs and services and goals of the organization. So on an annual level, that is twice that they're going through this and then their own onboarding. So it just reinforces what they should know and should be doing. Yeah, I think that's smart. Um, I, I let's Let's answer some more questions and then... I want to ask you a question about board cultivation. Um, mm. I know. So I'm going to come back to that because you, you said something and I, I want, it's a different conversation. Let's get to um, Carrie from Seattle. She writes, does the CEO or executive director of a nonprofit ever have a vote on the board? Well, I've never heard of this. Some of our board members think it is a good idea and that it might help us to be more structured in our board management. This is a fascinating question. I've never, ever seen this question. What do you, what's your response? You know, I have seen where some executives in a nonprofit sit on the board. I don't know exactly how they operate, uh, whether they have to, you know, abstain from certain voting topics. Mm -hmm. um, and if there are those parameters, then I think it could work. Um, you know, when I started AMCF, I've never been a board member just to avoid any. Huh? Um, exactly. So they respect my opinion, but they make their own vo vote and choices. Mm -hmm. um, so it is a healthy dynamic, mm -hmm. um, but I have relinquished any sort of control in that aspect because I just want the organization to be more effective and healthy and don't want egos involved. Right. I mean, for me, Muhi, this is absolutely not done. Um, the CEO works for the board. There needs yeah. to have a board chair. The CEO mm -hmm. should not run the meeting. The CEO should help 
board the board chair with a board liaison that's the key yeah. element um, to structure get those things done compliance um, and I agree with you the board you know should listen and have the CEO have the opportunity to give their report weigh in on things in a structured meeting I'm, I'm a big believer and I'm aging my dating myself in Robert's rules of order you know just a, a you know like a structured thing so it's just not like a free-for-all but I yeah. think that um, this is a, a big problem a big problem and we we see this with founders we call it sometimes yep. founder syndrome mm -hmm. um, I mean so I don't think it's a healthy thing at all and board members should never be compensated. So that's like the one thing that I've always learned and heard. Um, so in that aspect, I completely agree with you. Yeah, right. I mean, God, we didn't even add that because you're absolutely yeah. right. I mean, no, it, it's uh, it's definitely something that we should, you know, uh, separate. And I think um, keep it cleaner and keep it more, keep the integrity of, of what a non, how a nonprofit uh structure functions reports out um because it's just it's not done you know it's not illegal um <laughs> but you know it's just not done and i think um you will find that most uh, nonprofit organizations have this in their board policies or in their you know bylaws where it's it, it discusses structure and so um yeah I, I think sometimes it's easy when you get um, maybe short on staff and you get a little fearful about, oh my gosh, uh, we only have a few board members. What are we going to do? So this leads me back to the question that I have to ask you, which is not on the deck. It's a curveball. Get up your catcher's mitt. Um, what are you doing? Yeah, that's right. You can tell I'm in baseball mode because, you know, season uh, ending here. What are you what are you doing about this? If if your organization only has three board members and you only have three year terms, and you're looking for people that fit a specific criteria. I'm assuming you're you you're not taking people outside the Muslim faith. What do you do? We'd be open to it. You know, that's not a criteria. Um, it's just really what is the board member's connection to wanting to be in a muslim serving organization right so there's no like that's not one of the requirements mm -hmm. but we are actively recruiting for people with skill set in marketing with skill set in uh, philanthropy with skill set in web development uh, and a whole host of categories so we're definitely looking for people who have the time to roll up their sleeves it's more of an active board um, and we meet monthly and it's a three to five hour commitment per month, uh, is what we say. So we're looking for people who can commit to three years. And, you know, a lot of people are testing the water. So some are joining our host committee for the annual symposium and Muslim philanthropy awards, and then interested in engaging further if they have a good experience testing the waters. Um, so yeah, we're actively recruiting and looking for people who can help out. You know, it's fascinating that you seem to have identified a path um, that it's not just like get on this board and start working. I love your idea of like that. And maybe that's, you know, you always talk about this with us and that's the stewardship piece, navigating somebody in through the organization to see if it's a right fit for them as well as a right fit for you. It's pretty damn 100%. smart. Yeah. Thank you. I it's think really so. smart. I mean, I can think about in my in my board service, very few organizations ever came to me and said, do you want to start here to see if you want to go there? It's generally just, you know, will, will you be on the board or not? Which is yeah. not a good idea <laughs> for anybody, right? Sure, yeah. You know, not a good idea. Interesting. Um, are you, as a co-founder, stressed out about this? Do you see that it's, Moving forward, what do you, what's your take on it? Yeah, you know, I think <laughs> the last year um, has been challenging at the organizational level. We have a really strong and awesome board president who has been the glue in that last year. 
So kudos to our board president there. Um, and I've had varying responsibilities. I've been a volunteer. I've been a contractor. I've been part-time, uh, the whole different mix. So it was working through the dynamics of our previous executive director and the board and what they wanted and seeing eye to eye and where I fit. So now I'm taking more of a lead in the organization um, and being a director of development, focusing on new business opportunities. And from the standpoint of our programs and services, our donor advised funds, you know, I've had three conversations with three individuals in the last three months that these people want to open up a DAF with $5.7 million, with uh, $2.2 million, with uh, almost $3 million. And that's where we need to be. And we obviously have so many families that are contributing in the thousands of dollars, uh, and we cherish those relationships, and many of them have been with us since day one. But the potential of AMCF is exactly what I'm excited about. So does it cause me stress? Does it cause me anxiety? Absolutely. But I focus on the upside and the potential, and that's why I'm in it. It's such an interesting thing because, you know, especially in the, the DAF world, and of course, any investment world, success begets success, right? I mean, yeah. people want to hitch their, you know, star to a wagon, and then they're like, okay, yeah, look at what they're doing. I'm going to, you know, go up. They're, they're moving up, and so I want to go with them. Um, and so that's a tough thing because I've got to believe at some point it makes it a little challenging for you to, um, I don't want to say deliver bad news, but um, navigate upset, right? And still yeah. communicate to your, to your potential partners. Mm -hmm. Hey, this is all good. We're going. We're hopping and a popping, right? Yeah. And even in this last seven years of being a startup nonprofit, we've had to deliver hard news and there have been growing pains. And we started with Google Sheets <laughs> to talk with our donors and communicate with them what their DAF balance portfolio was. Uh, but now we have a CRM and do all of that electronically. And But there are still some accounting challenges where their balance isn't accurate and we're working through those challenges. Um, so we're always looking at how can we deliver a better user experience. Uh, and I'm glad to be on the show in December to talk more exclusively yeah. about AMCF and donor advised funds. So, Well, before we let you go, you have, um, again, I, you mentioned it briefly, but if you could share with us a little bit more, you have a big um, uh, awards and, and community event yeah. coming up. Talk to us about that. Of course. So on Saturday, November 18th, uh, we will be having our Muslim Philanthropy Awards and Annual Symposium. It's modeled after AFP's Philanthropy Day. Yeah. Um, so we have a whole host of awards that nominations uh, can be done for organizations. Uh, and we will be celebrating that day. And also the topic will be on endowments. And we're going to be examining a few national endowments that our Muslim-led organizations have uh, and their best practices, how they started. Um, so it's going to be a great uh, two-hour program on Saturday, November 18th. It's virtual. Anybody can attend. Uh, and we'd love to have you there. You can find more information on our website, amuslimcf.org slash awards. Awesome. You know, um, especially the way things are at this moment in time um, with global conflict um, mm. and faith-based um, issues that come through, um, you know, the human experience. I think this is a great time to kind of pull people together and reflect on some bigger issues. And so... Um, it'll be yes. nice to hear more about that. For sure. And to that point, we have a uh, interfaith giving circle confronting hate. So a very great way to put your feelings into action and put your money where your heart is um, and an opportunity for people to learn more. I love it. Yeah, I, I, that's fabulous. We will be talking more with you. Um, you know, I know this is a part of your life and your leadership, and we don't really dig into it much because generally... Honestly, we have so many other questions for you. And we have, we were like, you know, we got to get through all this stuff. Yeah. So I've Fair. appreciated, you know, the opportunity. Muhi Kawaja um, comes to us today from Fundraising Academy at National University. They are our sponsor for Friday 
ask and answered. And um, it's always really fun to have Muhi on with us. Um, I really give him the business because I swear he behaves differently than with me than he does with Jarrett. So I, I just got to... I just got to throw that out. I think I'm the age of your mother. That's probably why. Hey, hey, everybody. We want to thank our partners who join us day in and day out. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are the folks that join us day in and day out and um, really allow us to have these robust unscripted conversations like we've had today with Muhi. So thank you so much. Hey, everybody, as we like to end every episode, we want to share with you our mantra. And I have to tell you, Muhi, I, I hear it in a different way. It seems like every day when, when I say this, but it goes like this, to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here for another episode of The Nonprofit Show. Thank you, Muhi. Thanks. Bye-bye.